go bye bye and uh, then we'll talk about you for five minutes and how wonderful all this was and everything. <laughs> um, and then we're, we'll run it next week, right? Okay. Which is I when mean, your show's going, I think. Yes, um, it's on Friday. On Friday. Yeah. Ooh. It, like Friday, Friday next? Where are we? This Friday. Okay, this Friday. so it'll be, Ooh, all right, okay. no worries. Okay, it'll okay. be running concurrently. All right. Are we, are we ready, Wendy? We're ready. Um, sure. Okay, so stand by. Look. I uh, hope I don't lose my uh, my fabulous headphones. Okay, okay, here we go. Wendy. Yeah? In her book, I'm Afraid of Man, Vivek uh -oh. Shreya, who is <laughs> yeah. a queer transgendered woman of color and a renowned artist and musician and writer, she writes, what if you were to challenge yourself every time you feel afraid of me and all of us who are pushing against gendered expectations and restrictions? Whoa, that sounds like... Sounds like a big challenge, but, but you, like, what, what are you afraid of? Well, you, you know what? I, I, I am afraid. I'm not afraid of Vivek herself, although I am in awe of her talent and probably the intimidated would be the right word, but I'm worried I would say the wrong thing, you know, <laughs> and that in this sort of well-intentioned middle-aged white lady, and yes, I'm still hanging on to middle-aged, that I'll just say something that's just going to sound stupid. Well, I'm middle-aged too. Um, what, does that, <laughs> what does that mean? 120. <laughs> <laughs> so what is like, say it, say it now. Like, what's the worst thing you could say? Like, go, yeah, go for it. it. Yeah. <laughs> and then what's the worst thing you could say? I don't know. I've said some stupid things in my life. Like ask my kids. I say something stupid every day, but it's mostly about making assumptions that some people might find offensive, you know? Yeah. Well, tell some me race, about it. Color, um, gender and all those things. Yeah, don't don't ask my daughter because I'm. I think everybody's done this, but you know, Vivek, she's dealt with that all her life. Um, it's what she means when she says, "Let's challenge ourselves." Oh, and it's not like she's not approachable. How to fail as a pop star is her latest show. It's a TV yeah. series uh, based on her live stage show, and she calls it an anti-success story. Uh, growing up a nerdy little brown boy in Edmonton, dreaming of becoming a pop star on the scale of Madonna. Yeah, well, I would like to be Madonna too, but but guess what? Um, it didn't happen for Vivek, um, or at least she didn't become Madonna the way that she, that she thought she might. Well, being a pop star is a, a very time-specific goal. Like, I hate to tell you, it's too late for us. No, um, no, no. Look, yes. We can do it. No, you got to accept that, you know, your limitations. And there were a lot of obstacles in Vivek's way, like like starting out as a nerdy little brown boy from Edmonton. Yeah, well, we can talk about Edmonton, we can talk about Madonna, but... I mean, the main thing is is in the title, How to Fail as a Pop Star. So Vivek says we don't acknowledge failure properly. We always, we talk about success all the time, but we really talk about the risks and challenges of finding that. It's better to have loved in vain, loved and lost, than never to have loved at all. I don't know. That's, well, that's what they say. Um, anyway, that's what let's, Tennyson said. But in any case, here's Vivek sitting here listening to us talk about her. Have, uh, how are we doing so far? <laughs> uh -oh. You're doing very good. <laughs> that was really nice. That was a, like probably the most creative and slightly most like out of body intro I've ever had. So thank you. <laughs> out of body. Oh dear. <laughs> Where does yeah. Start? We're so glad that you were, I mean, you must be busy. You've got your, the, the show, how to fail as a pop star. It goes on, it goes this it goes well now. we're going to air this yeah, uh next now. week it's going to it's like it's airing now it's it's kind of like a, a big deal and i don't know how to fail like who's gonna watch that and yet as <laughs> as maureen says it's about the challenge of failing it's uh, I, I don't know it's a brand new way of looking at failing let's talk more about that what is it so what does that mean to fail because you sure as hell don't strike anybody as a failure so <laughs> Let's, oh. let's, let's talk about that. Well, I mean, the show, first of all, thanks so much for having me. Uh, this is really nice. And yeah, thanks for making time for me. Um, yeah, I mean, it's an interesting time because when I go on social media, like literally all every post of mine just has like the giant word fail like everywhere. And so I have to do a lot of like internal work to remind myself we're talking about something very specific. You're not a failure as a human, but you're talking about being a failure as a pop star, which is true you did fail at becoming a pop star and that's the point of the show so um yeah i don't know <laughs> but you do it with song and it, you, know, you entertain as so really the, um, i mean i understand what you mean about not being afraid to embrace failure because you have to 
you're never going to do anything if you don't. But you are. I mean, you're not a pop star on the level of Lady Gaga or Madonna, but you are a pop star. Oh, yeah. I mean, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what else to say to that. <laughs> well, you could sing. Why don't you sing? That would be uh, that would be good. No, it's should stay. I would only be in. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Well, you told me to sing, so what am I going to do? <laughs> and you did, and you did. Um, well, is that one of the songs that you sang at the West Edmonton Mall? Because I'm fascinated by that. We've heard so many stories, but I never realized that they had a talent show. So that was like your big breakthrough. I think like Madonna got her breakthrough starting oh, at a mall, Brittany, didn't she? Avril, there was like a bunch of stars where they started the mall. Yeah, we had something called Youth Talent Quest. And it would start out in the smaller malls. And then eventually, if you made it to the semifinals, you'd get to play at West Edmonton Mall, the pinnacle. And then our equivalent, are you all from, are you Ontario based, Toronto based? Yeah, Toronto based. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Easy. So Easy. like yeah. we had something in Edmonton that's sort of like the CNE called Klondike Days. And so like the finals would happen at Klondike Days if you made it to the finals. So I, I'm from the like the south side of Edmonton, so I would do these like, yeah, competitions in a food court. They just like make shift table like outside like New York fries, and you'd be like smelling in the food and <laughs> <laughs> singing your heart out to an audience. And um, yeah, so it was fun to recreate that, like recreate that in the show, you know, like the sort of like that era because it's such a normal thing for so many pop singers, like you know, where, you know, you have to pay your dues and part of paying your dues is singing them all, apparently. <laughs> what, what was it, what was it like to cast yourself? But I mean, you have two younger actors, Chris De Silva plays you as a, as a teen. And then uh, uh, Adrian Pavone, is that how you pronounce Pavone, it? Pavone, yeah. Pavone is you as, as a younger uh, person. So, I mean, that's gotta be weird. It was very weird. I mean, you know, that dinner table conversation you have where you're like, if an actor could play you in a movie of mm. your life, who would it be? Like, I feel like 95% of the population doesn't get to have that realized. <laughs> and so it's a very strange thing to actually be like, well, these are the two people that <laughs> play me. Were you um, part of the casting process? I was, I was, I was very lucky that because the story is based on my life, uh, the producers at Sphere and Vanessa Matsui, who directed um, the show, the shows really wanted me to be part of like every phase and stage of the project. So I remember just like watching audition tapes and my partner coming home and being like, what are you doing right now? And I'm like, I'm, this is potentially me. And he's like, you got a weird life. Like, <laughs> this is very weird. Why? Like what's happening over here? <laughs> so yeah, very surreal. It's like, it's like kind of recreating your own multiverse, you know? <laughs> yeah. It must have been so weird. And I, I guess the other, the, 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 you've made jokes about the other title for your show could be a star is not born. Yeah. And yet you're, you're kind of a star. Like you, <laughs> we keep trying to tell you now. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, it's so funny because this is how this project goes, right? It's like the moment you, and this is why to me, I think it's so important to talk about failure is that, I had this happen where I would tell people I'm working on a show or working on a play called how to fail as a pop star, which is how this project started. And people would start listing my CV back out to me, yeah. you know, being like, Oh, like, but what about your Mac campaign? You weren't you on a billboard at young and Dundas and you've gotten this nomination. And you know, it's very similar where you're like, but you're still a star. And again, I think it's coming from a well-intentioned place, but I do think like all jokes aside, it does prevent us from owning our disappointment, you know, owning, mm that the pain of like the mourning of letting a dream die. And I think that's actually a really universal experience. I think a lot of us have dreams like, you know, I, I don't know what your dreams were, but I don't know that it was sitting and chatting to me via the internet. At, you know, <laughs> kind of, this was it. This was I don't, kind know, of. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> believe you. <laughs> but, there, but there are other things. I remember talking to the, the um, then CEO of a very big company and uh, asking him if he hadn't, ended up doing this what would he have liked to have been and he said a hairstylist <laughs> mm. but he was sincere he was like that and that opportunity was never there for him he was right. destined to do what he had to do but for a lot of reasons and so it's not that he's not a successful person it's just that that aspect of his life 
never got to be nurtured. I know it sounds kind of funny and adorable, but he was sincere. No, but like, that's the thing is we all have these dreams. And again, we end up where we end up in life, you know, for various reasons. Some of it's systemic, some of it's outside of our control, some of it's just circumstance. And, you know, I think there is a lot of pressure to own that, to be like, well, my, you know, I'm happy things worked out this way. Or if I didn't open this door, or if this door, door didn't close in my face, then I wouldn't have had this and this and this opportunity. Like, we're so quick to do that kind of work. And for me, the show and the project is really about, like, pushing against that a little bit. Like, what does it mean actually to tell, you know, as I've been saying, an anti-success story, you know, especially in a culture that's so obsessed with us at all times being like, look at me, I'm doing this. Look at me. I have a podcast. Look at me. I, you, know. <laughs> you know, it's like, who are we when we're not just listing out our accomplishments? And I think sometimes what we don't get to be is our disappointments, our, the rejections that we experience. Like we're, we're not allowed to hold space for that, you know? Why? I'm, I'm curious, why did you or why do you maybe uh want to be a pop star so bad i i, I heard somebody say on a podcast of course that <laughs> men go in men become rock stars because they want to get laid um, so i i hope that there well maybe i don't hope that there's something more to it for, for i mean you, but yeah and i think the show pushes against i think you know, there is something about pop stardom that seems really trivial. Like that's what's kind of cheeky about the show. It's not like how to how to fail at like, you know, curing a virus. It's like how to fail at <laughs> saving the world. Star. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like my little dream was just wanting to be a silly old pop star. But I do think that some of that, um, some of that lens is rooted in sexism. Like when I think of some of the biggest pop stars in the world and people who have shaped our culture, you know, like Whitney Houston, Janet Jackson, Madonna, Diana Ross, like those are women. And I, I feel like there's a, a way in which we talk about pop culture that somehow sometimes dismisses the contributions of those kinds of artists. But to answer your question more specifically, like, you know, as a brown queer kid in Edmonton who was experiencing relentless homophobia every day, I think that like turning on much music and seeing people connect in this way and use their voice in, in a way, I was like, that's, that's my ship out of here. <laughs> That's, that's, that's how I'm going to survive, you know, like, and by out of here, I don't just mean Edmonton. It's like, if I can go on stage and have people praise me instead of say something homophobic, um, that's how I can earn love. That's how I can, that's how I can get through that. That's going to give me meaning. And so I think, you know, some of that's a little displaced, <laughs> you know, like I, I don't, as an adult, my relationship to the stage is very different. I, I try not to go on stage with the, the hope of just, you know, adoration. Uh, but I think as a kid, when you, all you're experiencing is hatred on a day-to-day -day basis, you are looking for where can you feel loved? And for me, pop stardom mm. was the place that felt like I could, if I worked hard and if I sang my heart out, people would love me. Hmm. There's also yeah. more acceptance, I think. Uh, certainly, I, I have a, a young friend who is who is a very talented uh, theatrical actor who's going through, uh, who's going, well, they're only 17, uh, but they are transitioning or hoping to. And as so I know, the whole family. And uh, there's greater acceptance within musical theater than there is anywhere else. And Totally. And their parents are concerned that, well, but that you can't live your life you know, backstage or on stage, that uh, there's a harsher reality. I guess my question to you, Vivek, is do you think it's easier or harder now for, for kids like you were and there are? Who want to be pop stars? Who just want to be famous and want to be loved and want to be true to themselves. Yeah, I mean, again, like, I, I think one of the things I, I try to push back on, too, is like, I always have struggled with the word fame or celebrity. And part of it is like, I think there's some people who like, really want to be famous. And like, when I think of fame, I think of like, being known for the sake of being known. And for me, my desire for pop stardom was actually really about connection. Like, it wasn't like, I just want people to know me, I really wanted to be able to give back. Like, I'll never be able to give back to Sarah McLaughlin and Fiona Apple and Tori Amos. Like, these are people who like their music, like, again, gave me another day to live and I'll, I'll never be able to repay that. But if I could make music that can make other people feel the way those artists felt, uh, the way those artists made me feel, then my life would have meant something. And so for me, that's always been the intention, um, whether or not, I mean, I, I think another thing that's been really interesting on working on the show is what is a pop star in 2023? I think there is a world 
And I think part of why people uh, do race to read my CV back to me is there is a world in 2023 where you have, you know, a couple thousand followers on social media and you're an influencer where you are kind of a modern pop star, right? But again, for me, my ideas of pop stardom were cultivated around the 80s and 90s, like playing giant stadiums and being on the David Letterman show. And so, um, you know, I do, I do think that in some ways the music industry um, is a little bit more accessible because of the ways that people can create these songs on TikTok and, you know, go viral. But I also think some of that is a little bit overstated. Like I think for every person who goes viral, there's a lot of people who are making TikToks that nobody sees. Um, I do think that, you know, in terms of progress, we, we are seeing more queer, openly queer musicians in the pop world, but like not a ton, you know, no. like it's like Lil Nas X and Sam Smith, and, you know, like mm. on that level, it's like in 2023, like there's still only two, you know, like, but, and then, well, you know, there are two really big ones whom you yeah. just named, but there, there are a, a sure. number on the sort of middling level of, of, of success sure. right now, whatever sure. that the means. Last the last series that uh, we've just got like tiny previews of, of the season and the, the last one, there is a, a young Brown queer uh, person. I don't know what pronoun he wants to use. She wants to use, um, but it's almost like you're jealous watching it because you didn't have those opportunities. And I'm, and I just, I find that really interesting. So are things getting better? I mean, that's what you're talking about and better, but not really very different. I mean, I do think that for me, when one of the things, you know, when I worked on the stage play for How to Fail as a Pop Star, one of the things that came up from the director was like, well, if you were going to guess why you failed or how you failed, what, what would be the reason? So I had like this homework that I had to create. So I actually created mm -hmm. a list of 40 reasons of why I think I failed. And, and in the show, we hint at it. There's like post-it notes in the last episode of things that yeah. was written. Yeah, I saw that. And wall. it was all about being a brown queer boy or... Yeah, or like, uh, I don't yeah. have abs. I don't have leather pants. I don't, you know, like... <laughs> but the first thing that I Gordon. wrote was, I, I, I think the first thing I said was I was born in Edmonton. And then the second thing I wrote was I was born in 1981. And I do think... I mean, it's so hard to know what my career would be like, but I do look at the younger generation and I really try to limit envy around that. Like I really try to turn my envy or jealousy into support, but yeah. it, it is hard not to sometimes look at, you know, artists who are coming up 10 years like later for me or 20 years later for me and be like, whoa, like the things that you, the world you get to live in, the, the way that you can access language, even talking about your queerness, your identity, like this conversation we're having right now, like the ways that we've like already mentioned pronouns and all this stuff, just like in passing, we're not even talking about yeah. that. This conversation could not have existed in 1998, you know, yeah. like in the yeah. same way. And so it's hard sometimes not to be like, it's less about envy and jealousy of like younger artists, but more like, man, like, and I even say this in, in episode eight, right? It's like, I wonder what it would be like if I was starting my career now. Like, I'll, I'll never get to have that experience. And so it is something that haunts me, you know? Like, and these are the things you can't control. Like, I can't go back in time. And I, I you know, it is, it, it is what it is. But I even remember in 2003, when I put out my first album, like, there was such a pressure to perform a certain kind of masculinity. You know, that was around the time that Justin Timberlake had just come out solo and, you know, you still had to like carry yourself a certain way. And I was like, it's dance music, it's pop music. Like who cares? Like, I don't know what we're hiding here, but like, there was still like, I remember just, you know, this pressure to perform a certain way. So mm -hmm. anyways, I, I do think a lot about like time and, and, and the things that I didn't get to have. And, and wearing the, leather and pants the, or not yeah, wearing leather but, pants. Sure. Was, uh, I mean, the so other thing insulting I, in a way. Sure. I mean, I'll come back to that in a second. The one thing I will say really quickly is one of the things I try to hold in my heart is like the artists that came before me who didn't get to have the things I get to have, right? Like it's yeah. easy for me to get more like bogged down by like, look at all the things the young artists get to have, but I get to have a lot of things that artists that are 10 years old or 20 years mm -hmm. older didn't get to have either. And so I try to like find a balance there. The leather pants is like, for me, you know, um, just to catch viewers or listeners up, there's a moment where, well, should we talk about this? Or yes, I don't know yes, if we want to give away spoilers. Well, do you? Oh. <laughs> Was this a question <laughs> that you were going to ask? Or? Well, <laughs> no, no, yeah. You, can, you know, you can go there or not. I don't, I think, I don't think you're going to give too much away if you're going where I think you're going. Well, yeah, I, mean, I think I, it's just the idea that if you're like, if, if you're performing and you're, 
you're leaning in a certain direction. You're supposed to wear leather pants. Like, uh, it, yeah. it, it just seems so ridiculous. And, the and you fought back aspect against that. Of masculinity as opposed to, well, I mean, we always say that for femininity is performative, but I don't think we've really given enough uh, time to think about how, I mean, the Barbie movie changed my entire viewpoint about <laughs> performative masculinity. Totally. <laughs> leather pants. No, I mean, I think what we're trying to get to in some of those early episodes, like even when Matt G is like, we should put some sitars on here. Like, I think when you're a, like, can you name five brown pop singers that you know that aren't Freddie Mercury? You know, like it's it's a pretty small genre. Like the, we exist, but in terms of notoriety, it's hard. And one of the things I ran into a lot when I was starting my career is that, and even to this day, is that people don't know where to peg you if you're not white. Like if you're not white, or maybe if you're not black, and maybe now if you're not indigenous, maybe, I don't know. But generally, if you're not white, we don't know what to do with you. And so it's like, can you lean more into being gay for us? Can you just be a little bit more gay? <laughs> can you wear some leather pants? Yeah, but, you know, exactly. The way that or, gay people wear leather exactly. pants. Exactly. Like, yes, yeah, ridiculous. Like Ricky, like Ricky Martin. Or can you be a little bit more brown? Like, you just, you got to pick a lane. <laughs> Whatever you're doing here, sing Alanis Morissette with your dad's suit on. Like, we, like <laughs> we don't know what's happening. We don't know how to track this. And I do think that there's a way that if you're marginalized and you're trying to be an artist, you are asked to perform for the gays, whether that's the female gays, I mean, sorry, whether that's for the male gays or the straight gays or the cis gays, like you're always being forced or asked or requested or pushed into performing for the gays of the majority. And I think mm. that's part of what the, what my character is dealing with at the beginning is like these people who are, I think, well, well-intentioned and see that my, my character has talent, but the only way they know how to move him forward is by being like perform more for the gays, you know, like, and not gays as in G A Y S, but like the gays, you know, yeah. the gays, the <laughs> if they were see. like perform more for the gays, I think my career would have been a lot better, but <laughs> <laughs> that's not what they were asking. Um, so you've got long blonde hair. Uh, you're very sexy. Um, it, we, you, you are. And you aspired to be like Madonna. I, I, I loved Madonna. I don't like her anymore for uh, uh, not the obvious reasons. Just find her very, very uh, grating and, and, and harsh. I'm not talking about her appearance, um, but I loved her. I adored her. And you'd mentioned Britney. And I mean, this is some, these are people that you've kind of incorporated into your appearance now, oh, unless I'm completely wrong. That's what I'm getting is this, this, the year, this, you know, beautiful blonde woman with long curly hair and high heels and, and jewelry. And, and, and so has that been a true vision for you the whole way or have you evolved? You know, as I we have all have, look, it's been interesting. Like the blonde hair, I think was like tricky when I first started because I, like I started dyeing my hair blonde in my early twenties. And I do think that there was something about like wanting to assimilate. I found that especially like at the gay bar in Edmonton, like if I, had blonde hair. And if I was wearing my blue contacts, like people noticed me, they looked at me in a different way. You know, mm -hmm. gay culture in a lot of ways is still actually racist. We don't talk about this enough mm -hmm. because you assume that if you're a marginalized community, you don't marginalize others. But some of the places I've experienced the most racism has been in the gay community. And so I do think in my early years, like in my twenties, I think there was part of what drew me to blonde hair was a certain kind of assimilation. But in my forties, I think and my thirties, like I've been blonde now, I think for five years, um, it really isn't about being white. Like part of it for me is like, well, there's a lot of ways to be Brown in the world, you know, like mm -hmm. who says that white people get the, like the, like ownership on blonde hair, right? Like who says that this has to be just for blonde people, uh, for, for white people. And part of it's like, it just feels like who I am. Like, you know, even my hairstylist is like, do you ever think you're going to go dark? And I'm like, I don't think so. And he's like, yeah, you're blonde, aren't you? You're and I'm like, blonde. I'm you know, I need to add this to my bio and sort of like queer trans POC, just be like blonde, blonde, <laughs> just, just blonde, just blonde. blonde. So is, yeah, I mean, it's Maureen, a good question. Is, is Madonna a blonde? Like, what is she now? Like, I, I, right I am not a, a fan. Of, well, let's not talk about her appearance, but, but I do find. That's not and, what, it, and that's it, not what I don't, that's not why yeah. a lot of people have given her a hard time and she has every right to do whatever she wants with the way she looks. I just, I find her cold. That's what it is. I find her cold. <laughs> I mean, and that's I think what the vibe the real, I get off her. This is what I think the problem is, is we have no more mystery. Like, I think mm -hmm. that sh we we're just never exposed to people in the same way that we were now. Like, I, I, you know, to see 
an artist. I remember I used to have to like stay up or like put the timer on my VHS to see them perform on David Letterman and maybe they'd get an interview. And then maybe I, I would read a magazine where they're on the cover of Rolling Stone, but that was the only way we could access artists. And it was kind of beautiful because there was this mystery, there was this mm. enigma. I mean, it also meant a lot of male artists get to like do a lot of shitty things. Oh, sorry, bad things that went. Oh, okay. um, we don't care. Go for it. <laughs> but I think the problem with the world that, that we live in now is that people are overexposed. So we see artists in ways that we've never seen before. And I'm like, you know, to use Madonna as an example, like, is she that way now? Or is she always been, but we just never saw it as much. Right. Like, yeah. I think like there's so much pressure to be on social media and content, content, content. What are you doing now? What are you doing now? And it's like, I, again, I miss the days of not knowing. I don't want to know what my artist thinks. I don't want to know what they're cooking for breakfast. Like I, I just, want to line up outside of HMV, buy the album and like get into it and make it my own. I want to have See, my own relationship. <laughs> that's so interesting because it seems to be uh, a dichotomy because you connect with your fans and they are your, for your audience, your followers, your readers, your students, because you teach uh, creative writing um, in Calgary. Do you not? I do. University of Alberta. So, I mean, it's all about connection. And yet it's interesting that you should say that as a fan, you actually don't want to connect beyond the art, the, the music or beyond I mean, the artistry. I feel a lot of pressure. So if I'm going to be honest, like if I could be the kind of artist that those artists were in the nineties, like I do think that there was something about it that's very privileged, right? Like I'm, I'm just going to show up when I show up and do my thing. Like I just don't think young artists or, or even artists that are not young <laughs> get to have that freedom. Like, I think that there is a pressure at all time for any artist in 2023. And this is where I actually do feel really sympathetic to younger artists because when I was a teenager, like I didn't have everything captured on the internet and I didn't feel pressure to capture everything on the internet. And there's so much pressure at all times to be doing that. And I, if I could have my way and if I, you know, wasn't promoting a TV show, <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 you know, and I even try to find a balance. Like for me, when I go into Instagram, like I try not to have it on my phone. Um, I try to like, I treat it like Hunger Games. I go in, I post something, I try to like a couple other people's thing because I believe in a reciprocal environment and then I get out of there. Same with Twitter, like see a couple things, get out. Like I, I try to minimize how much I do. I still haven't done TikTok, even though people are like, you need to be on TikTok. I'm like, do I need to be on TikTok? So it, it, it sounds like a contradiction, but it's like, again, that's, that's what I miss. And that's the artist I wish I could be. Um, but unfortunately, like, if you don't have big ad dollars, <laughs> one of the best yeah. ways to get people to hear about you and connect about you is, is social media. And that's why we all sold our souls to it. Right. <laughs> I'm curious. Who you, who you... This is, we know exactly what you're talking about, right? I don't, we don't yeah, want to we're trying to build up our social media presence at the moment. And it's a, uh, it's a challenge, which uh, you, you, you talk about, but I'm curious of who you think your audience is. Like I, I read that you, you said that there's two audiences. There's, I, I'm kind of tired, I think you said, of, of, of feeling like I have to teach people about what it's like to be a brown person or what it's like to be a trans person or or whatever. So, I, But I do think that people need to learn. So are you talking to those people, which are probably a larger group, or are you talking to a smaller group of people who are who see the world the way that, that you see the world? The converted? <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Again, as an artist, my hope is that my art reaches many people. I think one of the things I put out a book, I mean, that you referenced, I'm Afraid of Men, um, in 2018, and it really sh changed or confirmed my perspective. Because one of the things I've heard my whole life is that as a trans artist or queer artist or brown artist, that like my work is niche, right? That the only people who can understand me or relate to me or want me are a certain small demographic, which I've always pushed against because I'm like, well, if I have no problem rocking up to Sheryl Crow in my bedroom as a white kid. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I don't get why, you know, white people can't or cis people or queer, uh, straight people can't like read my work or listen to my music and not make a connection. And I'm Afraid of Men was a national bestseller for like, you know, I think like two or three months in Canada. It was like the Indigo staff pick. And <laughs> it was really affirming because I'm like, oh, actually, if there's a lot of infrastructure if there's a lot of marketing, if it's pushed by a giant publisher like Penguin Random House, then actually so-called niche work has the opportunity to reach a lot more people. And part of what I haven't had is that infrastructure, right? So um, I'm, I'm realizing here that I'm not answering your question, but in terms of like demographics, I, I really hope 
that my work reaches a lot of people. I really want to push against the idea that it's limited. At the same time, I think internally the choices that I'm making are different. So in my 30s, especially, I found I did feel like I needed to like bring people on my side by doing some educational work through my work. And so in some ways, my work was for the gays. And part of it's also being smart about who your audience is in Canada, right? Like the reality is like, who are book buyers in Canada? Who are music listeners? But the, or dominant music listeners, I should say, and dominant book buyers. But the older I get, the more I'm trying to find ways to speak to my own community and to, to do things my own way and to do less explaining. So to talk about Popstar, one of the things I'm so proud of is that it's an extremely diverse show. It, it is a, a queer story. It is a brown story. It's a trans story. But none of those things are mentioned. At no point, my character has an identity crisis. They never come out. They're never like, I don't know who I am. Mom, will you accept me? Will somebody <laughs> accept me? I'm in so much drama about this. I'm so conflicted. I don't know who I am. Like, none of that, that is there. And it's wonderful. It's like, to me, that's what I mean when I say that I'm trying to not make work for the gays. Because if I was making that show 10 years ago, I would have been like, okay, well, we should explain that the character yeah, right yeah. now is identifying this way. You know, there's like a little joke, I think, in episode like eight, where my character's like, and I'm a lady now, you know, moving forward. <laughs> but it's meant as a joke. It's not meant to be like, and it's and life. Yeah. It's it's just exactly. life. That's, exactly. That, that's what exactly. I really appreciate. That's, is that exactly exactly. Funny about people lady. don't feel they have to talk about how <laughs> I like to I like to have sex with men or I like to have sex with like who cares exactly. Yeah. Well, exactly. who cares? Well, I mean, well, but we that's all the thing is that's what people <laughs> have different expect. Interests, but but yeah. that's what people want from us, right? Like, unfortunately, that is what we've been told is like, when you're trans, we want to hear about your transition. We want to hear about how your parents didn't accept you. We want to hear about your body. If you're queer, we yeah. want to know how, like, you know, like, that's the thing. And so it's like, for me, what's great about pop stars is like, none of those things. That's not what the show about. It's just actually kind of a classic music biopic turned upside down. It's just about it a, is. A, a, like a small town boy who has big dreams. It yeah. just doesn't work out, you <laughs> Could know? Could be played by Barbara Streisand. Exactly. Then, maybe not now. <laughs> she's, got a, she's got a big bio coming out. I, I, I want to just point out something funny that I, we were talking about this weekend, that the word lady is now something you call someone when you're when you're annoyed. Lady. I know. I didn't know that this was a pejorative. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm I'm a new technically a new lady so yeah, yeah. i'm learning <laughs> yeah well you don't want anyone to call you lady because it's whatever's coming See, all i want is great. someone to call me lady like i got <laughs> somebody miss called me miss at cineplex and i was oh, like they're like that? they called you miss and i was like finally i'm a young girl <laughs> like, <laughs> i don't mind this. i didn't i didn't get I like that this. i don't like lady but i do not i mean i do like miss and i don't like lady i wanted to ask how well, it's better than ma'am yeah, yes. I know. Well, that's <laughs> like, we can all agree on that. Um, your mother played a big part in, yeah. uh, uh, in 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 your art and so on, and and your upbringing, and uh, and um, I'm interested. And she's played as a as a character in in uh, in, in the latest show. Um, how is your relationship with her? She was a super glamorous, beautiful woman. Yeah, I mean, I really wanted the mom in the show to like represent the kind of like fashionable mom I had. I think sometimes yeah. when I've seen brown moms on television, they tend to be more austere, you know, wearing a sari, like, you know, namaste. And my mom like shopped at Raitman's and like, yeah. you know, like was like kind of like at least fashionably cool. I mean, and the mom's also very supportive on the show. And yeah. I mean, I leaned hard in that direction. I think in reality, my mom's a bit like my mom. There is a part of her that really wanted me to be a doctor, a lawyer, engineer. That's the reality. But we've seen that story. <laughs> so many hard wants. Yeah, exactly. But we've seen that story so many times. And I'm like, let's actually see the side of my mom. Who's also somebody who like, even though she wanted those things simultaneously, she like loved my singing and has always to this day been like, you've got a golden voice. Never forget that. You know, like that's yeah. the thing Aww, that she tells me the most. Nice. So I'm like, let's show that, that part. So uh, my mom in some ways on the show is also a composite character. <laughs> so now, yeah. like, like, what do you do now? Like you, sh you wrote the soundtrack. So you wrote a bunch of songs for, for the series. So you're still kind of, you like you sang for us. Have That's you, have true. you given, have you given up the idea of being a, a pop star? A what? A, 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 not a musician. You'll always be a musician. It's like I being mean, a I, priest. You can't that... not be one. <laughs> that's exactly it. Like I think music will always be part of my life and pop star, I think I realized when I turned 30, like, like you said, like pop stardom definitely has a clock on it. It's kind of like dance. It's not like, you know, with books, there's that meme that circulate. That's like, don't worry, Toni Morrison didn't write her, you know, first book until she was 40, but pop music isn't like that. Like it's very age centric. And so 
Um, but despite knowing that I had failed as being a pop star, even though I didn't name it that way, I've tried to like find different ways to like continue to have music in my life. It really is the greatest love of my life. And yeah. And I think if I'm going to be really honest, there is a part of me that like will always think that I will be the exception. Like who knows, maybe the show will be the thing that gets me a Grammy. Like, you know, like it's like I, I you can still make a show about failure and still like be delusional about your dreams. Well, Mick so. Jagger is still going. So, I mean, I, he had a few yeah. years, yeah, but a few decades started earlier. It's, a it's about where you start. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's about where you start. <laughs> we have loved talking to you, Vivek. So I'm, I'm, I, I it may be, too old for me and Mo to make it as pop stars. We we may be past the prime. Um, I we hope it's not over for you, but oh, uh, that's yeah, nice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But in the meantime, how to fail as a pop star is uh, playing on CBC Gem, and uh, probably because podcasts live forever. By the time you're listening to this, it may who knows it'll be picked up by PBS third season, or third season. Third season. <laughs> <laughs> Do we in have a second? Time. <laughs> It was uh, it was just lovely to meet you and a pleasure. Thank you so much you. for this conversation. I really appreciate it. All right. Good luck with everything. Thank you. All the best to you. Yeah. And thank you for doing this. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, I actually got through that without saying anything embarrassing as far as I know. Well, who knows? Like I <laughs> probably said thing. I think right off the top I said something about how, yeah, well, fail, you know, failure. That that that's very attractive as a uh, uh, to get audiences to come and and check out, and he was like, "What?" But yeah, uh, she, but other than that, she, I don't think it was she, too. She, she. Can we start uh, again? Uh, <laughs> Can we start again? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. There we go. Just a sec. I I will. Uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna start this again. I'm stopping. I'm starting. Well, I for one managed to get through that. I think without saying something stupid. Maybe I did. Who knows. Well, we'll never know. I, I think I said something at the beginning about failure not being the most popular topic, but uh, yeah, <laughs> that's not good. <laughs> um, you know, but what I was going to say though, the thing is, we, it's great that we can now have conversations about music and fame, where it doesn't come down to, as Vivek said, what it was like for her to transition, or that, or, or using pronouns, and all that is now part of the general discourse, and we don't really have to go into it. But nonetheless, it's still there. It's still yeah. It's well, I, I mean, I bought years ago. Uh, sorry, Katie Couric. Yeah, I remember twenty years ago, Katie Couric, uh, who's a, a journalist. She's of our vintage, maybe even a little bit older. And she her an interview with somebody about being gay. Oh my god! Oh my god! So what is it? Tell me exactly what has happened with your surgeries and and. And I think it was a real turning point for people to say, no, who cares? Like, who yeah. cares about that stuff? Like, maybe your best friend wants to tell you about some horrible thing that they went through at a doctor's office, but that's not what it's about. That's It's mm -hmm. about we're all people and we all just want to express ourselves. And uh, yeah, so things have changed a lot. Well, they have changed, but they haven't changed entirely. I did want to bring up Bilal Beg, who is the creator and star of Sort Of. Yeah. Uh, uh, and has so, and in fact, Vivek was a consultant, a musical consultant on the show. Um, another and, CBC show, which is, uh, it's great actually. Yeah. 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 But Bilal, you know, very much is, uh, talk, or doesn't talk, but acts and tells the story of, of, uh, a person who doesn't fit into any category, who is a brown person who dresses as a woman. Um, and, uh, I, I thought that was interesting that, that, we didn't go there, as a matter of fact, because it's I think the whole point is that this should not be the center of the conversation. It's an interesting aspect of it, but not the only topic, if you know. Yeah. And the vex thing is that, you know, if 20 years ago, if, if I'd been starting out, would it have been different? And I and I think, you know, we well, talked a women, lot about Madonna. Yeah. Uh, Madonna, you know, people made fun of her because she was a woman who was trying to be a rock star. And, yeah. and I think that she's super or was super talented, but she wasn't treated that way. And Vivek's argument is like, OK, well, things are now changing for for other people, too. And uh, yeah, but not quickly. <laughs> They are, and they everybody. aren't, you know, for us, we're all like, we're all, it's like preaching to the choir, choir, we're all allies, we're all on board, we're all, you know, accepting, why wouldn't we be, but, you know, I'm, I'm I can assure you, we're, we're not the majority, not yet. Anyway, on that cheery note. <laughs> uh, so, will you say something stupid? Will oh, you I'm, say sure, something I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm, I'm, I'm probably 10 out of 10, just for this episode. <laughs> on to the next. <laughs>